It's Sunday morning, and we are in a study on prophecy. When I say prophecy, I'm talking about all of the history of Israel, and that is what has to do with the end of time. I have people call me all the time and say, how close do you think we are to the end? I don't know, but we're close. I don't believe that this world can go on much longer. I believe we're headed right into eternity. There's devastation throughout the world. There's economy has fallen apart. Uh, we've got war and rumor of war, as the Matthew, the 24th chapter says. We've got nation rising against nation. And all of this has to do with prophecy and the end of time. And probably the greatest key to the end of time is Israel becoming, becoming a nation uh, in May 14th. 1948. That's the first time they've been a nation since 586 B.C. If you'll notice, that's 2,600 years since they've been a nation when Nebuchadnezzar carried them away into captivity. What's happening now in the Middle East has to do with what Israel did back here, causing them to be carried off into captivity and being in captivity 2,600 years. Now, most people will say, yes, but wasn't Israel back during the days of Jesus? No, absolutely not. This, if this were Israel right here, and this is Africa down here, here's Egypt, here's Israel, here's the Mediterranean Sea, here's the Red, what? Here's the Red Sea, and uh, this is where Moses brought the children of Israel across the Red Sea. They wandered in the wilderness right here for 40 years, and then they came up here north of the Dead Sea, came through what we call Jordan. That was called the land of Moab and the land of Ammon. Ammon, Jordan, A-M-M-A-N, is the capital of Jordan. That comes from the old ancient uh, Ammonites or the Ammon system. Well, Israel was brought back. They were carried away after having been a nation here for 500 years under kings and about 275 to 300 years. There's a difference in opinions about that. Uh, but it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 years under judges. Well, they kept going after Baal and the grove and Shemash and Molech and all these gods. This is, and God scattered them because of that. He scattered them all over the world. And during the days of Jesus, God had given Israel, but not Israel, He'd given southern Judah, which is southern Israel, He'd given them four decrees. Four decrees to come back and rebuild the city and the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed in 586 B.C. Well, only southern Judah was back from the captivity during the days of Jesus. You say, what does that have to do with them being a nation? Northern Israel was ruled. That's the ten northern tribes. And they were ruled by the tribe of Ephraim, and Ephraim was the second-born son of Joseph, and Ephraim, or Joseph, received. Joseph received the inheritance through his son Ephraim, through his second-born. So during the days of Jesus, only southern Judah was back. The inheritance belonged to Joseph through Ephraim. Therefore, the Jews said, if the one who owned the house wasn't home, then nobody was home. So only Judah and Benjamin was back from the captivity during the days of Jesus. And if you notice, the Pharisees would always ask Jesus and the apostles, are you going to restore the kingdom? What did they mean? The kingdom of Israel was under the rule of the Roman Empire over here in Rome. And they would allow Israel to rule themselves as long as they behaved. And you had Roman garrisons all over the city. They weren't ruling themselves. They weren't a nation. They were a province of the Roman Empire during the days of Jesus. So when you get to the end of time, you get to May 14, 1948, for the first time, 
since they were carried away, they're a nation. And all this time, all that time, they're under the sword. They're under the beast. They're being slaughtered. They're being butchered until Jerusalem ceased to be trodden down to the Gentiles. And that didn't happen until June 5th through 10th, 1967, in the Six-Day War. In that Six-Day War, Jerusalem was delivered for the first time since they were destroyed. Everything about the 70 weeks of Daniel is about the end of time. People say, but we don't know when the end's going to be. Let me show you a couple of verses, and they always go to Matthew 24. They don't go there. They don't know where it is. They just quote at it. Go to Matthew 24. Matthew. <clears throat> we will know the season. And we're in the season, folks. We're at, what we need to be doing is concentrating on truth and living godly and righteously and holy. I heard my father and his friends try to preach prophecy. Most of them didn't know a whole lot about it. I'm not trying to put them down. They were free willers. They were involved in dispensationalism, and they didn't know what they were doing, including my father. Now, here in Matthew, <clears throat> the 24th chapter, <clears throat> the apostles come to Jesus. They say, let us show you the temple, how magnificent Herod's temple is. Some say it took up about 28 acres, and they had these stones in the temple that were 40 tons. They were huge. And Jesus said, the time will come when one of these stones will be not left upon another. And they said, when will these things be? And what is going to be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Your parousia. See, I, you, you hear me say that so many times. Mary said parousia. You'll hear me say that so many times you'll get to where you know it. It means physical arrival. They're saying, when are you coming back? Now, I'm not going to get into preterism right now that says he came back in 70 A.D. That's ridiculous. And he came back in a flash of lightning in the temple. They're not saying, when are you going to come back as a flash of lightning and go away again? They're saying, when are you going to come back and stay with us from now on? And he gives them all these signs. He said, well, many will come in my name saying I'm Christ and they'll deceive many. There'll be nation will rise against nation in verse 7. Wars and rumors of wars, verse 6. He says, the love of many, walking in God's commandments, will wax cold. Love is agape. Boy, we are there right now, aren't we? The love, the agape, will wax cold. I go out in public every day. I talk to people. I witness every day, two and three times a day. Nobody wants to talk about this. I don't jump anybody's case. I just try to talk. And they'll clam up and look at me. And that's all I can get out of them. Usually if I go into a store and they all see me on the TV, they'll go, Hi, Pastor Brown. Hi, Mr. Brown. It's kind of like they're backing up like they think I'm some ogre and I'm going to go out and jump on them. It's kind of it's kind of funny. You ought to go with me sometime. Except Marjorie. Uh, except Marjorie, yeah. Marjorie's down at the... She serves the samples down at the store. But most of them are like, Yeah, I've seen you. I asked one fellow, I said, you ever see me on TV? He said, who hasn't? <laughs> I think it's funny. <laughs> and I don't try to jump on him. I just try to sit. I don't try to get in the 70 weeks of Daniel and predestination. I talk about repentance. I was walking out of a, I got to tell you this again, but I was walk. I went down and stopped, picked me up a uh, sub down at the firehouse or whatever they call it, firehouse sub. And I was walking out the door, and this great big tall fellow, about six foot five, about 20, 21 years old, he said, excuse me, sir. I said, well, you're bigger than me. You got the right of way. I said, I used to want to be tall, but all I want to do is go to heaven when I die now. He just went, <laughs> they don't expect that. Sometimes I use the simplest way to witness to somebody. If he had been interested, he'd turn around and say, what do you mean by that? All I do is throw a little hook out sometime. And pull it in if I can. Now, so we're talking about the end of time is going to be the end of the 70 weeks. I believe it'll be the last seven years of time 
And we're going to see as we move towards that seven years, we're going to see the signs. Now look here in this chapter 24. We'll see the abomination of desolation. I believe that's where the sacrifice in us will cease. They won't allow us to take a daily cross anymore. The oblation was the bread offering. The bread is the word of God. They won't allow us to talk about that out in public. It's not like they're going to say, we're outlawing the Bible. They're going to say, look, we need to tolerate one another. Let the Baptists be Baptists. Let the Muslims be Muslims. Let the Catholics be Catholics. And Look, there's no need to offend each other. And we're going to make a... a we're going to amend the Constitution where everyone has their right to freedom of religion except those of you who want to offend all the others. I believe that's the way it'll come about. Then he talks about, some will say, here, Lo, here's Christ or there. He said, Don't you believe it? There in verse 23, he says, If they say he's here, if they say he's there, it's not true. And he says there'll be great tribulation such as was not from the beginning, no, nor ever shall be. Now that can do, that can have to do with not just ISIS, which, which is an offshoot of Al-Qaeda, and they were so barbarous that, that Al-Qaeda wouldn't have anything to do with them. They were too, they wanted to kill too many people. They are an offshoot of Al-Qaeda. They, Al-Qaeda is kind of a pansy group compared to ISIS, and they're in every nation in the world and they're in every major city in the United States. But it's going to be more than that. It's going to be an economic situation. That'll be the famine. Remember the four judgments of God? The sword, that'll be war. When men are rebellious against God, there'll be the sword, the famine, that'll be economy. And we're headed for a crash, people. The pestilence, that'll be disease, and the beast will rule the world. The beast is not a man. It's a world-ruling system. It is Babylon, the mother of harlots, ruling with self, or let us make us a name. He said, if anyone says, lo, here is Christ or there, don't you believe it there in verse 23. And he goes on to say in verse 26, wherefore they shall send you. He's in the desert. Don't go, don't go to the desert. It's not true. Behold, he's in the secret chambers. I've got so many people Along the way, say, I talked to my, my grandmother, talked to uh, her dead mother in her bedroom one night, and talked to Jesus one night. Jesus said, that's not true. And then he says, as the lightning shines from the east to the west, in verse 27, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then you got the last trumpet sounding, starting in verse 29, after the tribulation of those days, the Lord shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. Angels, plural. Of course, that takes you over to Revelation 8, 9, and 10, where you got seven angels with seven trumpets, and the seven angels are the seven spirits of the seven churches. That's us. Then he goes on in verse 32. I was just skimming through that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in that. Verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. Israel was called a fig tree. When his branch is yet tender... May 14, 1940, and the fig tree begins to bloom and it begins to bring forth fruit and putteth forth leaves. You know that summer is nigh at hand. You can tell by the fig tree, by Israel, even by the literal fig tree that summer is here. I got two fig trees in my backyard and they're growing like crazy. You can tell summer's here. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things. I mean, see the fig tree bloom and blossom. Know that, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass. The one where the fig tree is blooming will not pass till all things be fulfilled. I believe we're in that generation. Either that or we're heading right into it. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Then everybody quotes at, they don't know where it is, but they quote at verse 36. But of that day and hour, but he's, now remember he just said, when you see the fig tree bloom, you know that it's near even at the doors, Right? But of that day and hour knoweth no man. Nobody knows the exact time, but we will know the season. 
No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming, the parousia. That's the original question. What's going to be the sign of thy physical arrival? The physical arrival when he comes as the lightning shines the east or the west, and nobody's going to know. It's going to be sudden. Judgment's going to be here suddenly. For as the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. To give in marriage means to marry two different things. They're marrying truth to a lie in the world. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and they knew not. Who knew not? Well, Noah knew, didn't he? The people that were believers, the few that were inside the ark knew, knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the parousia, the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be instant. It's going to be judgment. And we will know because we're inside the ark or inside the fold of God. And we're going to see these things happen. Now, he says... They'll be giving in marriage, they'll be partying, it'll be having fun. America is entertaining itself into hell. Without theme parks, without computers, without computer games and all of this, people seem to be bored. They don't want to live. He goes on to say that when he comes, there'll be two in the field, and the one shall be taken and the other left. There's going to be two men out there working in the field, with a scythe, cutting down the wheat, or on a job, or down here at a factory, and one will be taken out to meet the Lord in the air, and the other will be left to be destroyed. Then he says, Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Now you have to go back to the culture of the day. These ignorant, homosexual people that want to make that a fair, uh, an alternative way of living. They say, see, these two women are grinding. They're having a sex at the mill. You're stupid. They had, a, they had a millstone, and they had on top of the millstone, they had this lava stone, and they would turn it. One would hold the other one, and the other would turn the grinder, and they would be grinding wheat or grinding whatever they need to grind for their meal. It has nothing to do with homosexuality. That's disgusting to me when somebody says that. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, if the good man of the house had known what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you don't think the Son of Man is going to come. We don't believe in a pre-trib rapture. We believe we'll go right up to the end, and then the judgment of God will fall upon the earth. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his house to give him meat in due season? Blessed is that servant when his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing this meat. Jesus said, I have a meat to eat of that you know not of. It is to do the will of the Father. Go over here to 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. I'm simply showing you that you're not in dark. You're not in darkness. You should be able to know the signs of the coming of the Lord. I believe we are in that time. And if you listen to this 70-week series, what we're aiming at, we are going, we are going through the 69 weeks and these are weeks of years, 69 weeks. And those stopped, those ended at Jesus coming into Jerusalem at the end of his ministry on the young colt of an ass when he looked out over Jerusalem and says to Israel, If thou hadst known even thou this thy day the things that belong to thy peace, now they're hidden from your eyes. So the Jews were blinded at the end of the 69 weeks or the end of the 483 years, there's 70 weeks, 70 times 7, 49, 490 years, because all the time Israel was a nation, they had a sabbatical year every seven years, and they had to let the land lie fallow, and they never kept the sabbatical year, and they went after all these other fertility gods. 
So God says, I'll scatter you. And he does that. And this is a long story about the end of time. And along the way, we'll go through it if the Lord don't come first. Now here in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, you can sit back and be lazy and say, well, I'll just let you do all the studying for me. I'll do that. You come and sit down and I'll, and I'll lay it out for you. I've been studying prophecy intently since about 1964. I've been hearing about it since about 1949 when my father started preaching. Been hearing about it from Baptist preachers, but most of them did not understand this. Verse 1, chapter 5. First Thessalonians, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Remember, if the good man of the house had known what watched the thief would come, he'd have stayed awake, not suffered his house to be broken up. But he's not going to come as a thief to us. Let's continue reading. He'll only come as a thief to the unbeliever. For when they shall say peace and safety. Now they're trying to come up with a peace process. In the 70 weeks of Daniel, in the 70th week, the last seven years of time, there's going to be a peace declared to the world. The 70 weeks ends with the 70th week. And the 70th week is divided into two sections. It's divided into three and a half years, three and a half years. The first three and a half years will be years of peace. And then the judgment of God is going to come down upon the world. And the world system will attack the church the last three and a half years. Now, we're going to go through all of this. It's called a time, times, and half a times. Or it's called 1260 days. Or it is called 42 months. 42 months is exactly half of seven years. 1260 days is one half of seven years on a 360 day calendar. And the, and the man of sin will declare, he'll declare that the sacrifice and the oblation, which is in you and I, will cease at the midway point of the 70 weeks. That's where we're headed. You can blend together all of this terrorism in the world, the economy. You can blend it all into the sword, the famine, the pestilence, all the disease, whether it's Ebola or AIDS. Or, and there's a lot worse out there than Ebola and AIDS, believe it or not. If you want to contact the Center of Disease Control in Atlanta or go online, look it up. They'll tell you all these different diseases coming on the world. I've got all kinds of stories about it. I got a book called The Coming Plague. I've got several books about this and how that this is coming on the world. It's all the judgments of God, the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the world beast system. Now, let's continue to read this fifth chapter. We're not the children of the darkness that that day is going to overtake us as a thief. Those of us that are believers. When they shall say peace and safety, the only way they're going to stop all of this world problem we've got, and it, it didn't start with Al-Qaeda or Hamas or Hezbollah or ISIS or Taliban. That's not who it started with. It's been going on for, for millennia. I mean, we've had, if it, wasn't, if it wasn't Vietnam, it was Korea. If it wasn't Korea, it was World War II. If it wasn't World War II, it was Germany. If it wasn't Germany, it was, it's been wars after rumors of wars, and it's not going to stop. It's just going to get evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. It's going to get worse. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. As travails upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Proverbs 29, 1, a man that hardens his neck, and he stiffens his neck at rebuke, he'll be suddenly cut off, and that without remedy. There will be no remedy. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. It will overtake those that are not watching as a thief. You are the children of the light. Boy, that takes us back to the spirits in prison, the division of day and night, light and darkness, doesn't it? Prison means the division of light and darkness. And Paul says, 
I've come to call the Gentiles to the light. And Isaiah says all through his book, the Gentiles will come to the light. And that's the New Testament church of New Testament Israel. You're the children of the light. And the children of the dark day, we are not of the night. That, that The thief comes at night. If you're walking in untruth, you're in darkness. Nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Let us watch and be sober. Not going around happy, happy Jesus, fun Jesus. Oh, isn't Jesus wonderful? Whoopee. Praise God. Let's be sober. That's a drunkenness. Smiley face people all the time that never want to face the truth. I never believe that. Therefore, let us not sleep as others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober. Let us be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, so we're not in the dark. What does that mean, we're not in the dark? That means Jesus said, I'll give you signs. And you will know the season when I'm coming back, and we're headed right into that season. I do not see how the world can continue to go the way it's going. I, the world wasn't, there were sinners in the world back in the 40s and 50s, but what's going on today, anything goes. When somebody comes out of the closet, they're applauded by everybody on TV and newspapers. Isn't that wonderful that he's come out and he tells us he loves men instead of women? Let's give him a big round of applause. That's insane, isn't it? And that's not my problem. My problem is the preachers. It's not homosexuality and drugs and rock and roll and rap. That's not the problem. And heavy metal. I thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> the problem is not Slayer or God Smack. That's not the problem. It's the preachers. I hear mush all the time. Now, we're talking about, I've got all these other verses on the end of time. And we're going to get to a lot of these, but I believe we're headed into it. It's time to wake up and be sober and live in truth. Now, look here. We're talking about the 70 weeks. Huh? The 70 weeks is going to end with the 70th week. And that will be the end of time. I'm absolutely sure of that. Now, let's go back to Daniel. Daniel 9. There's going to be a necessity for that 70th week to happen, which will be the last seven years of time. There's going to be a necessity. If you look at the world today, do we have a problem having world peace? That's the whole idea of everything that's going on. You've got Greece and Italy are going bankrupt. Uh, America is going bankrupt. Uh, Japan is going bankrupt. Bankruptcy is, we're sitting on the, just on a, on a fence all over the world, just teetering and tottering. We owe so much money in America, we will never pay it. Do you know what they talk about when they're talking about balancing the budget? You know what they're talking about? They're not talking about paying off the national debt. That's not what they're talking about that's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. When they say balance the budget, they have a budget they're living by in Washington that's passed by all these senators and these representatives. They're talking about, here we've got an $18 trillion national debt. We had a $3 trillion national debt back in the early 90s. They upped it to $9 trillion here just a few years ago. Now we're up to $18 trillion. Excuse me, trillion. Okay, I got it. We're up to $18 trillion. You going to pay that off? Ain't never going to happen. They're talking about the interest on the national debt, just paying the interest. But we don't have enough taxes to pay the interest. So what they're talking about in, is cutting spending. Now this is a, a Republican attitude. Republicans cut spending. You think you can cut, they're saying, let's cut spending on this program over here. Uh, we'll get around to taking away Social Security from 
Jim Brown and those people, uh, if you're headed towards Social Security, you probably won't get it if you're 20 years from retirement. Maybe if you're 10 years from retirement, you probably won't get it. And let's cut spending over here, uh, giving food to certain countries, and let's cut spending over here, and that way we can take the cuts. And, of course, the Democrats say, let's build up, let's build up spending so we can... Uh, so we can bring about jobs and people have more money to spend. <laughs> they're not going to pay this off. Democrats and Republicans are crazy. And what they're saying, here's the interest right here. Here's the interest that we have to pay on this. And this is how much we bring in right here on taxes and monies to pay this interest on this debt. They're talking about cutting spending over here so they can get enough money to pay the interest on the debt and keep upping it through the years and so forth. It's not going to happen. <laughs> We're never going to pay this off. They never, and we are committed to, one of the professors at, at Boston University said, we're kind of committed to 225 to $235 trillion. And you know what that's called? Famine. You can put, you can just put famine all over the, over the right here. The economy is famine. It's not going to happen. Is this a sign of the end? Well, yeah. Is the wars and is who's going to curb Al Qaeda? Uh, who's going to curb Hezbollah, which is uh, or Hamas, which is right next door to Israel? Nobody's going to curb them. I've got to read something to you. It's just very shocking. I've said it to you. But there's a man who is a, he's an authority on the Middle East. And his name is Walid Ferez. Walid. Brilliant man. He's a Lebanese guy. He's an American, teaches in colleges. And I've read some from this before, but this is future jihad. Jihad means a holy war. You have peaceful Muslims, and you, but the peaceful Muslims, which are the majority, do not run the show. It's all of these, it's all of these terrorists that run the show. It's amazing to me. I've got one book on ISIS, and they could have asked me, and I could have told them what was going to happen. And what, ha what I said was going to happen about two years ago, happened. I thought, gosh, you don't have to be a genius to figure this out. When, when Obama said we're going to withdraw the troops from the Middle East, I said, you can't withdraw the troops from Iraq. I mean, that's a little makeshift army that we're going to leave them in charge of fighting Al-Qaeda and Taliban and Hamas. And these guys are an organized army that's got 100,000 soldiers in it. And you're going to leave that little that little Iraqi army over there to fight them? They'll come in and slaughter them, and that's what they're doing. That's what Mr. Ferris says in his latest book. They're coming in just running over them. I thought, <laughs> you say, what's the answer for this, Jim? There is no answer. Jesus coming, that's all. Do you think we need a world peace with all this going on? That's called war and rumors of wars. Nations rising against nations. Kingdom against kingdoms. Is, is somebody going to be needed to rise up and step up? What is somebody going to do? Step forward and say, I'm the Antichrist. I'm going to bring war and peace. No. <laughs> it's going to be the man of sin who will be the head of the world beast system. You have to take into account what is the most powerful political structure in the world? Huh? United Nations. United Nations is the most powerful political structure. And they're supposed to be non-partisan towards religion because you've got people from every nation serving there. And the Secretary General is the head of the United Nations. There'll have to be some kind of system. You say, Jim, do you have the answers? No. They'll, this is the prophecy of Scripture. There'll have to be someone step forward. It'll possibly be head of the United Nations 
the super powerful people among the Bilderbergs and trilateral commissions, the United States, China, Russia, they'll have to come together in some gathering and say, we need to get along and let everybody be what they're going to be. Let the Baptists be Baptists and the Muslims love Muslims and the Buddhists Buddhists. And that's going to, it's probably going to happen during the middle of that 70th week of Daniel's 70 weeks when the sacrifice and the oblation will cease. That's where we're headed. Let me read this to you. This is in future jihad. I've told you this before. But if you think it's going to stop, it's not. Mohammed. Mohammed started Islam in the 6th century. What he did, he brought together all of the old ancient fire worship religions of the ancient world into a monotheistic religion. All this before Muhammad, you had tree worship among these people, fire worship, fire worship. In fact, the word over there in, in uh, excuse me, Isaiah 44, when the Bible says they would take an oak tree and they would start a fire with it in Israel and they would cook with it. And they would heat themselves with it. And they'd make a God out of it. And Israel is condemned for doing that. And the word oak is the word Alan. It comes from the word Allah. Allah originally was a tree. When Mohammed began Islamic religion, and they have something in the development of Islam. They call it Al-Fatah. I'm going to read this to you. And this man is one of the, this is a picture of him right here. He is a, he's a professor, a teacher, a uh, brilliant man. You'll see him on NBC, MSNBC, extremely intelligent. But they probably dictate to him how far he can go. I'm just going to read one paragraph here to you. They have this alpha ta. They say anyone who gets in the way of the expansion of Islam you place yourself in jihad. We have done that May 1948, May 14th, 1948, when President Truman pressured the world, declare Israel a nation at the National Council of Tel Aviv. We're talking about the 70 weeks of Daniel. We're talking about the end of it. We're talking about the end of time when we're talking about the 70 weeks. Do you understand that? We're, we have to be getting close. I know you're interested in your house and your car and your job and your future and all of these things, but there's something more important. I'm not saying get rid of your car and forget your house. No, I'm saying what should be foremost in our mind is what, what Paul told the Philippians, think on these things. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, all these wonderful things, think on Christ. Whatever we do in word and deed should be all done to the glory of God. I don't care if you're working your job. Clean your mouths up. Clean your lives up. The end of time is coming. It may not be, I may die before it gets here, but some here will probably be alive when this thing starts exploding. It's going to explode. Now, let me just read this to you. They're talking about a, a caliphate, a caliph. If you watch any old movies, you'll, you'll see a mention of the caliph is going to come in. The caliph was the head of the Islamic system. He was elected by, we had two, we had a problem with, these people are fighting over there. You have the, the Sunnis and the Shiites. The Shiites, the Sunnis, this is, these people believe that you can be elected by the Islamic leaders, Islamic leaders, and the Shiites say you have to be a descendant of Ali 
who was the son-in-law to Muhammad, and and these people, and you have to be one of his descendants to be the caliph, to be the head of the religious system. And these people hate each other so much that they're fighting one another until the people from the West come in. They say, well, let's lay down our arms against each other. Let's get together and fight the Yanks that have come. I'm going to go into some of this more. You say, Jim, what is all this history? It has to do with the signs of the end of time. Let me read this to you. The Caliph created a unilateral dynamic of moving forward. In other words, moving, moving the Islamic State forward. There is to be no reversal of the geography of the Islamic State. Once they, once they possess something, you try to deter them from that, you are putting yourself in jihad. America went in jihad May 14, 1948, supporting Israel. All those wars, the Sinai War of 1956, the Six-Day War of 1967, the war, the Yom Kippur War of 1973, and all the wars there. Now, it all has to do with Israel going after all of these gods and being scattered. And the sword, the famine, the pestilence, the beast is going to be here just riding at the end of time. That's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. On the contrary, there is only one way open for the Islamic people, onward and forward. This doctrine was called Al-Fatah. Translated literally, the opening or the opening of Islam. Now, we're going to be at war with them till Jesus comes, but there's going to be a peace that's declared and it's not going to be real. There will be no peace until the Prince of Peace has come. In simple geographical terms, he says, let me put it simply to you. Fatah was the conquest of non-Muslim lands. They're on a conquest to rule the world. One of the writers said Hitler was really a beginner compared to these people. They have found out the way you, what you do is you go into the land, you buy all the property in the United States you can, you set yourself up to attack America, and they're set. Now you say, I'm going to walk away and forget all this. Well, it's not going to help you when, the, when, the, when we start seeing some nuclear warheads go off in America. But that's not the only jihad there is. There's a jihad in the universities and colleges. The Arab people put hundreds of millions of dollars into the American universities. They dictate what can be printed in the books. Did you know that? You don't get the truth by watching these talking heads on the news. Jim, I'm going to talk loud. And sorry to interrupt. But make it quick. One of the most important books in the last 20 years. He's written two more books. You um, talking about the Wall of Paris. Yeah. It's incredible. He is incre he's an incredible writer. L listen to this. In simple geographical terms, Fatah was the conquest of non-Muslim lands. It was the legitimization of the expansion of the state of Islam. It was not called occupation. It was perceived as a divinely authorized march into the land outside the state of Islam. They're saying they have a manifest destiny to conquer all the infidels all over the world. Invasion has a name in Arabic. Ejtaya, occupation, has another. Etalal. Both have negative connotations which would invite legitimate reprisal from the conquered peoples, hence the inventors of the word fatah. We're proposing a new term that means practically both invasion and occupation. They're here, folks, like the little girl said in the poultry guys. They're here. And you can walk away and ignore it all you want. I'm not here to talk about yeah, I see. I'm on a mission along the way. It's the most dangerous terrorist uprising in the history of the world. Every one of these writers will tell you the most dangerous because they're infiltrating the entire world. They're in every major city. They're in Nashville. 
Now, let's get back to what is this leading us up to the end of this? Anyone who gets in their way, we've done that. Every war that they've come up with, the fact that the World Trade Center came down, that has to do that we are supporting them. And the World Trade Center is where all of our, our economic system was seated. All of these loan companies, J.P. Morgan and all these guys, they said, we'll bring down your finances. We'll bring down your economy. Now, what I'm doing is trying to point to these things to you so you can see this. I've got so many things to say to you. I wish I could say it all. Let me, uh, let's go back over here to Daniel 9. You say, Jim, I don't want to hear that. I know that. Do you want to hear the truth about what's going on? One of these writers said, never has a nation ever been so deceived by its elite leaders as America. We have been deceived. We don't even know what's going on. We didn't know that we were at war with Islam when the World Trade Center came down. We didn't even know that. But see, they don't just come and do something all of a sudden. They have a long-range plan. Even, even Osama bin Laden didn't like it when they brought down the World Trade Center. They're eventually going to do that, but he had a long-range plan. And what happened, this was a, a group of men. They fight among themselves. But this was a group of men that took it on themselves as Islamic jihadists to bring down the World Trade Center. He had a longer-range plan for America. When he wanted to bring it down, it was going to come toppling. So what that did was put a warning throughout America and throughout all of our, our Homeland Security and FBI and CIA people so that they could be on the watch more and be watching our airports and so forth. They, I, I saw that one of the writers said that, well, it was that in the, I think it was in the news this past week, like 100 people were, were uh, terrorists working in our airports across America. That, did y'all see anybody? Y'all see that? Like something like a hundred terrorist connected people are in our airports across the country. Now, and we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. That's what's going to be rising up here at the end of time. Let's go back to Daniel 9. Remember, don't forget as I'm teaching this, what Israel did here in the Old Testament, sword, famine, pestilence, and beast coming in, and they went after Baal and the grove, etc., that caused their scattering to the end of time. And during that time period, during that time period, they were in captivity for 2,600 years. When they come out of captivity, we're at the end. Well, Mary, I'm doing the best I can. You want to come up here and write, you write. We'll do what we can. My pens are not writing well. I need, need a whole new box. So I just got a new box. One second. Now what I'm trying to do as I'm trying to... Let me do this, Mary. What I'm trying to do is to show you, is to point to you how that everything that happened over here is resulting at the end of time, the end of the 70 weeks. 70 weeks. Or it's going to be, I don't know what's wrong with these things. I'll try another one. Need to get me another box of them, I guess. Y'all, excuse me. I'll just press real hard. All right. Everything that happened in the Old Testament from 1 Samuel, from 1 Samuel through 2 Chronicles, has brought about the scattering of Israel till the end of time. Are they scattered now? Huh? No. We're facing the end of all things. Let's go back over here. I'm wanting to get over to you the necessity of a peace process at the end. It has to come about. But it's going to be a false peace. At the end of that process, the first three and a half years of the 70 weeks of Daniel, 70th week, 
everything's going to break loose against the church. The last three and a half years of the 70th week. And at the end of that week, Jesus will come in the air and take us out to meet him. To me, there's nothing more serious than the Word of God. Me and Mary talk about this every day, all day. I think about it when I wake up in the morning, all through the day. I want to, <coughs> I'm always wondering, <coughs> who can I talk to about truth today? I've learned I don't get too deep with most of the world. They can't handle it. They don't know anything. So I talk about repentance and daily cross and self-denial and living righteously and godly and holy. That's mostly what I talk to people about, and that scares them bad enough. Did you know that? That'll frighten people. Now, go to Daniel 9. God's measuring out a time period for Israel to repent, and at the end of that time period, he's going to cause that repentance to come about. Because you've got spiritual Israel, which is the church, so if there's a literal Israel, which there is, and people say, well, those not real Israelites. Let me tell you, those wars have been nothing less than a magnificent miracle. There has to be a living God intervening. These things could not have happened otherwise. Look here in Daniel 9. Daniel's in Babylon, crying out to the Lord. When are these things going to be? When are you coming back? When are you going to get us out of this captivity that we're in? The Lord sends, sends the angel Gabriel to tell Daniel, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. We've already said that a sabbatical year every seven years. Let the land lie fallow so the land could restore the nutrients so the crops would grow again in the next cycle. We call it crop rotation. Well, they didn't. They went for 490 years growing every field and all you're going to do is burn the ground up, burn the nutrients up, pull it all out. It won't grow anything. That's why God sent, he, sent Elijah in the, in the eight, in the seven, I'll get it in a minute. In the 18th chapter, excuse me, 17th chapter of 1 Kings, he sent Elijah to pronounce no rain for three and a half years upon Israel. And Ahab just got all bit out of shape. That's an idiom. All right. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, verse 24, Israel, and upon thy holy city to finish all of their transgressions that they were involved in while they were a nation. All these gods they went after. To make a final end of their sins. Well, who's going to make sure this is happening? God. Are they going to have a free will to do this? God's going to have to use a sword, a sword, for 2,600 years to break his people and to bring in spiritual Israel to the church and to make reconciliation, kafar, cover sin for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness for God's people. It's determined upon his people and his city, isn't it? And to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. The most holy was the holy of holies. In the temple of God. It was the Holy of Holies. It was called the house of God. Because he dwelt between the cherubim. And Christ is a son of his own house. Whose house are we? So when the last one comes into the fold. And the last one is anointed. The total house of God will be anointed. At this end of the 70th week. We're going to see the seventh trumpet sounds. In Revelation 10 and 7, and that's when Christ comes back. We're looking towards the end of the 70 weeks. Now, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, there were two things. The, the Bible speaks of it as being destroyed. When Nebuchadnezzar came in in 586 B.C., the temple was destroyed, tore to the ground, the big stones were pulled down, and all of the vessels of the house of the Lord were carried away by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon. And the city was to utterly annihilated and destroyed. The walls were burnt, the gates were burnt, the homes were burnt, and as the old pagan kings would do, they would come in, level it, ply it up, sow salt in it, so it wouldn't grow.
Nothing to grow there. Israel looked like a wasteland. That's the reason for the lamentations of Jeremiah. Now, the temple and the city were destroyed. So you've got, you got decrees to restore the temple. That's in 2 Chronicles, the 36th chapter, Ezra, the 1st chapter, Ezra, the 6th chapter, Ezra, the 7th chapter. Then you have a decree to restore the city. That will be the beginning of the 70 weeks. He says it right here. From the going forth, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, the city. Remember, he said up there in verse 24, 77 is determined upon thy people and thy city, Jerusalem. And the Messiah, from the going forth, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Nehemiah 2 is where this happens. Nehemiah 2, until Jesus the prince. A prince is one to be crowned king, but he was rejected as king and crucified as the Passover lamb. Now, we're, what we're doing is measuring this out. All right. Let's look at this right here. It will be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. Seven weeks is 49 years. Three score is 60 Plus two, that's 483 years. There'll be one set of seven years to go. That'll be at the end of time. There'll be a necessity for some world peace because of everything that'll be going on, and it's going on right now. Isn't it? This is not the 1940s. This is not the 1950s or even 1960s during the hippie revolution. We've never seen devastation in the world. We have never seen. What was it Mr. Obama said this past week? We don't even have the means or the knowledge of how to fight ISIS. He said that. Did anybody see that? Huh? Anybody see that? Him say that? He said, we don't even know how to fight them. This thing is getting hot and heavy, folks. Now, I want us to look at this. I want us to look at the going forth the commandment to rebuild the city. Go to Nehemiah, the second chapter. And the wall shall be built again in troublous times. Let's go to Nehemiah. You say, Jim, this is a lot of stuff. I know that. What we're trying, I'm trying to paint an entire picture. We're not just studying about some, some obscure 70 weeks on the Old Testament. That's not what we're doing. We're studying the 70 weeks and what it has to do with the end of time. That's what we're looking at. Anything I'm saying over here connected with the end of time. The only purpose for the 70 weeks was to cause Israel to repent of all of their idolatry over here. And God says, I'll cause them to down at the end of time. Is that, put, is that simple enough? All right. Nehemiah, second chapter. Nehemiah is a very, has a very important role in the 70 weeks because he is the man who receives the command to rebuild the city. Let's look here, Nehemiah, the second chapter. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, which is our month March, April. Nissan, March, April. Now remember, Nehemiah is over here in Babylon. He's going to be given this decree by Artaxerxes to go back and rebuild the city. Remember, there's decrees. Three of them have to do with rebuilding of the temple. They do that first, and then the city is rebuilt. All right. In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was brought, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now, Artaxerxes was a cup bearer. Sometimes the cup bearer is called the butler, not a butler that puts your clothes on, answers the door. It was a cup bearer. The, one, the cup bearer would taste the wine. If he fell dead, then the king wouldn't drink it. You understand that, don't you? Well, Nehemiah was a cupbearer. 
Now, it had not been before time said in the king's presence. It was against Persian law to be sad in the presence of a Persian king to the point you could be executed for it. Wherefore the king said unto me, Artaxerxes says to Nehemiah, Why is your countenance sad? Seeing thou art not sick, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very afraid because it was against the law to be sad in the presence of a king in the Persian courts. But Artaxerxes loved Nehemiah. That's in his favor. And he has received the word that the city, as the walls are burnt down, Nehemiah received the word from his brothers in the first chapter that the walls of Jerusalem are burnt to the ground. So Nehemiah says to King Artaxerxes, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be said when the city, Jerusalem, 650 miles away from here, the place of my father's sepulchers lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? What do you want me to do, Nehemiah? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, O king, if it please you, and if thy servant has found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build Jerusalem. Do you think that's important? I've never heard a preacher even preach on the book of Nehemiah. Remember, the decrees of the Persians and the Medes altered not. Once they put something in writing, Cyrus put the first decree in writing in Second Chronicles, the 36th chapter. Ezra, the first chapter, said Cyrus put it in writing, the first decree. Darius put the second decree in writing. Artaxerxes put the third decree in writing. And he's about to write down in a letter for Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem. And he's going to give it to him. And he's going to go back and tell everybody, I got the order from Artaxerxes. This is a law. And the king said unto me, and the king's queen was also sitting by him, how long are you going to be gone, Nehemiah? We love you. He was an honorable, honest, godly man. And when wilt thou return? Oh, by the way, he was gone 12 years to build a city, and Artaxerxes was really anxious to see him again. So it pleased the king to send me, and I, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, and you ought to underline the next words in red letters, let letters be given to me to the governors beyond Jordan. If the king signs a letter, it's law. That they may convey me till I come unto Judah. He's in Babylon. He's saying, give me letters to go over here on the other side of the Jordan River and go over here to Jerusalem, and I want to build that city. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest. This is extremely important concerning the 70 weeks. This is the beginning of the 70 weeks. That he give me timber of make timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to this house and for the house of for the wall of the city for the house that I shall enter into and the king granted me Artaxerxes says good I'll write that letter according to the good hand of my God upon me then I came to the governors beyond the river he travels six, between verses 8 and 9, he travels 650 miles, goes to the governor over here in Jerusalem, and it's always one of the descendants, one of the ancestors of Jesus, who would have been king if the Persian Empire had allowed him to have kings. Then came out to the governors beyond the river and gave him the king's letters. The king wrote it. He signed it. It cannot be rescinded. Now the king had sent captains of armies and horsemen with me, a great ambassage, men to protect Nehemiah, to say, hey, this is the king's law. 
And when Sanballat, the enemy of Nehemiah, wants to start a fight, and Tobiah, the servant of the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly. They didn't want the city built, and they are Nehemiah's enemies. That there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel, and they don't want the welfare. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I got up in the middle of the night. I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. I didn't tell anybody. He had the letter, came from Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes says, soldiers, you accompany this man and protect him. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. I went out by night, by the gate of the valley, even beyond the dragon well and to the dung port, and I viewed the walls of Jerusalem, and I got very sad, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire, and I was sad. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. All the walls are down. You can't even ride into the city. Then went I up in the night by the brook, probably the brook Kidron, and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. And the rulers knew not where I was going. The rulers of Israel didn't know. It was just a little province of the Persian Empire. And what I did, they didn't know what I was doing. Neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, even though I've traveled all the way over here to rebuild the city by the decree of Artaxerxes, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Do you know that most people don't even know this happened to Jerusalem? Most people in churches, do they? Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach, infamous anymore across the world. And then I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me, and as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me, and they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. And when Sanballat evil man tries to stop the work the Horonite and Tobiah the servant and the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian these are three enemies that's going to try to stop the building of the city but this is the decree of God isn't it heard it they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said what is this thing that you do will you rebel against the king then answer I them and said unto them the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. Get out of here. You're not part of my people. Now, from this commandment, later on, Tobiah and Sanballat say, Why, if you build that wall, a fox won't be able to stand on it. When they finally finished the city, in the ninth chapter of Nehemiah, they took a chariot and took men. I don't remember the exact, about 30 men, and ran across the top of the wall of the city. And these guys said a fox won't even be able to walk upon it. They had a chariot upon it and right down the city wall. Now, from the going forth of this command to restore and build Jerusalem, I already went through last week how people say, well, the first decree was the one the beginning of the 70 weeks, it can't be. If the first decree was given in on a Julian calendar, it was 586 B.C. Let me just say this real quick. The first decree given, when it was given in 538, and this is according to Julian, uh, not Julian, solar calendar. This is according to solar calendar, which is the calendar we use. 
in 586 B.C., if you take, this is according to solar years, solar, and you add 476 years, which is the same thing, is 483 years, 483 years, which would be the 69 weeks, this 476 years on a solar calendar would be the same thing as a lunar calendar, and I'll show you that later. This 476 years, you add it to 586, that takes you to 62 B.C. The second decree was given in 520. You had the 476, which is the same thing as 583 years. I'll show you that later. How can that be? We have leap years and... And they had to add years to the 360-day years. If you study chronology, you'll find that out. 476 years, that takes you to 44 B.C. If you take the third decree, which is in 457, you had the 476, which is the same as 583 on the 360-day year. You get to 19 A.D. If you take the fourth decree that we just read, in Nehemiah, you take the fourth decree, that was given approximately 444, 444 B.C., and you had the 476, that takes you to 32 A.D., the year that Jesus comes to Jerusalem in Luke 19. Let's look at it. Luke 19. This is when... I understand this is a lot of stuff, but this has to do with the end. I'm giving you some history that you won't get in any church in America. I hope you understand that. I know that. I've traveled all over America, preached in hundreds of churches. I've watched preachers for 50 years, and I never heard any of them preach. Has anybody heard anybody preach on the 70 weeks of Daniel? Nobody. And yet that is the bridge and the key Old Testament to new. That is the very essence of the end of time, getting to the 70th week. That's where we're headed. Now, this 32 A.D., from 444 to when Jesus came in Jerusalem, let's look at it. <clears throat> Luke 19. Now, this is Christ coming into Jerusalem on the young colt of an ass. Luke 19, this is going to be a corresponding verses to Matthew 21. Matthew 21 and 1. That's where Jesus looks out over Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I gather you under my wings as a mother hen doth gather her chicks, but you would not. And that's when they're crying, Hosanna. You'll also find this account in Mark 11, starting in verse 1. Mark 11, 11, verse 1. And you have it here in Luke 19. And this is Messiah, the Prince. But the Bible's speaking of there in Daniel 9. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. We just read it. Unto Messiah the Prince, he's coming to Jerusalem. We're going to start reading here in verse 37. When he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had done, saying, Blessed be the King! He's the Prince, but he's going to be crowned King! Hosanna is the word that is the word, God save the king. He's presented as Messiah the Prince, but he's not crowned king. He's crucified four days after this as the Passover lamb. That cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, Master, you rebuke your disciples. He answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. We are lively stones built up in spiritual house. And when he came near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, How many times have you heard me quote this? 
if thou hadst known even thou in this thy day the things that belong to thy peace. But now, Jews, you are blind, for the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round about. Keep thee on every side. So, we're at the end of the 69 weeks, end of the 483 years. Here's what happens. Here's the layout of history. Nehemiah 1, the decree goes out. Jesus comes in Jerusalem, pronounced king, but he's not made king. He's the Passover lamb. And then, 50 days after this Passover, comes Pentecost. Pentecost, Pent means five. And that's the birth of the New Testament church or spiritual Israel. And for 2,000 years until the end of time, we're going to wind down to the 70th week of Daniel's 70 weeks. I'm skipping a lot of details. But the whole idea of the 70 weeks is to point to the end. I used to preach on this in, in the 60s, and I really couldn't see a lot of things that I can see now. Now, let's go back to Daniel 9. And we're going to see what's going to happen during the 70th week at the end of time. I'm trying to... I'm trying to be as simple as I can. I'm leaving out a lot of details because I know the details, a lot of people can't handle that. Along the way, I'll put some of the details in. But go to Daniel, Daniel 9. You say, Jim, I'm just not interested in that. You will be when everything starts to pop. You know that? Do you know if you picked up somebody out of 1955 and moved them to today, they would say, what is this, hell? Wouldn't they? We live in an insane time. Well, I don't want to hear that. Well, you'll have to hear it when it all starts. It's happening right now. Now, back to Daniel 9. We're looking at the 70th week. All right. Daniel 9. How much time do I have, Mike? I was hoping to get to this earlier. Now, let's go and resume where we were. He says in verse 25, From the going forth of commandment, restore and build Jerusalem. That's Nehemiah, the second chapter. Unto Messiah the Prince. That's the 19th chapter of Luke, the first chapter of Mark, the first chapter of Matthew. Shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. That will be... 483 years, or 69 of these 70 weeks. What we're looking for is the fulfillment of verse 24 that comes at the end of time in the 70 weeks. Every prophecy that you can read in the Bible, no matter where it is, is aiming at the 70th week of Daniel, 70 weeks. That's called the last seven years of time. And ever since I was a little boy, I kept hearing about the great seven-year tribulation. How, didn't you hear that? Huh? It's not seven years. It'll be three and a half years of peace. And there's going to be, have to be a necessity for a world peace in order to stop all of this great devastation that's going on under the guise of governments and terrorists. And we're terrorists too. Did you know that? I mean, we slaughtered the American Indian. Nearly annihilated every tribe. There's only a few tribes left compared to what they were here when we first started manifesting destiny. We slaughtered the Mexicans, took their land. It's not like these people are doing something that America hasn't done, except they're a little more brutal, perhaps. Now look here, in verse 26, after three score and two weeks, or after the end of the 483 years, shall Messiah be cut off. Jesus will die, but not for himself. He's not going to die for anything he did. He's going to die for our sins, right? And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Titus will come in and destroy the second temple, Herod's temple, in 70 A.D. And the end shall be with a flood. A flood. When you find a flood, the end of the city will be with a flood. The end of the temple will be the flood. It's not talking about water. Let me show you something in, in Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. I 
I hope you'll stay with me on this and watch what we're talking about on this because this is very important. Look here in Isaiah 28. He's talking about the pride of Ephraim, northern Israel, how God's going to bring in the Assyrians and destroy them. Verse 2, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. He's talking about the Assyrian Empire being a great flood in Isaiah 8 and 7. He talks about the Assyrians being a flood. Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8 and 7. Now therefore behold the Lord bringeth upon Israel the waters of rivers strong and many, even the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria is called a great flood. Now let's go back to Daniel. Daniel 9. Read that last sentence of verse 26. And the end of Israel shall be with a great flood. And the end of the war against Israel. Desolations are determined against Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to be desolate. Now, this prince that shall come, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. The last 70th week. The last seven years of time. At the end of that, Jesus will come and rescue his people. What we're doing is pointing at that 70th week. That is the sign of all, the end of all things. But the reason there's going to have to be a peace declared in the middle of it is because the whole world is going to be upside down and somehow world governments are going to have to come together. Catholics are not going to become Muslims. Baptists are not, well, I started to say not going to become Catholic, but they already are. But the Pentecostals are not going to be Baptist. Church of Christ is certainly not going to be Baptist. There's going to have to be a tolerance in the world. That's the way peace is going to come. But it'll be a false peace. And then at the end of the 70th week, the church, spiritual Israel, will go under attack by the world system. And the Bible teaches that in the 13th chapter of, of uh, Revelation in the 20th chapter of Revelation. The church will be under attack. Not the Baptist church. Not the Pentecostal church. The church that's teaching truth. You'll say, Jim Brown, you're going to have to shut your mouth over there. If I'm living at the end, I'll probably be taken into custody. Either that or die for what I'm teaching. Because I'm not going to stop. Now, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. It actually says in the Greek Septuagint, it says the, I want to say this slow. In the Septuagint, it doesn't say the man of sin will confirm the covenant. The covenant is God's covenant, isn't it? If he brings about the things that he speaks of in Daniel 9.24, an end of sins, reconciliation of iniquity, and so forth. That'll be the confirmation of the covenant, won't it? It actually says in the Septuagint, the weak shall confirm the covenant. It says the weak shall confirm the covenant because it's going to take the full 70 times 7 for Israel to come into maturity, isn't it? And at, at their maturity, Christ comes. But it'll take slaughter and butcher and cutting down, being shot, having your throat cut. It's going to take whatever the world system wants to do to the church to mature God's flock. That's why he said, we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord, Remember the word remain is the word perilipa. Survive. survive. We that survive unto the coming of the Lord. Survive what? This great attack on the church. <coughs> it's really hard for us to believe that the world would attack the church. 
the Bible says in the 19th chapter of Revelation, when Jesus comes back on a great white horse, eyes as a flame of fire, a sword coming from his mouth. <coughs> Excuse me. When he comes back, that all the captains of the kings of the earth are going to go out to attack the Lord. Do you think they're going to take missiles out there in some base and say, there comes Jesus, zero in on him, get him. When you attack a man, how do you attack him? You attack his wife. I've said this before, when somebody attacks my wife, it's okay if you attack me. But don't you attack me in a fashion that affects my wife because you're on my bad side. You attack his wife, the church. That's what's going to happen. But they're going to do it by coming in here and saying, Jim Brown, you can't. We've got the fairness doctrine implemented into America now, and we've got it over there in England right now. We've got it in Canada. We can't go on TV in Canada because you can't put down any other preacher, any other's religion under the fairness doctrine. If they somehow amend the Constitution and say, Everybody's got freedom of religion, but we're going to tolerate each other. You can't put down somebody else's. Do you think they can do that to the Constitution? They twisted it. They twisted it enough as it is. You actually, maybe they wrote that in a few days, and it takes all these. It takes all these guys on the Supreme Court to figure out what they meant. They're going to do what they want with the Constitution. Now, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the seventieth week, in the seventieth week, he'll cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and that's called the abomination of desolation. The sacrifice. And I've said this before the sacrifice is not a sacrifice in a literal temple in Jerusalem. Every bit of that, Colossians 2 14, was blotted out, wasn't it? All the handwriting of ordinances, the rituals are blotted out. Anybody who starts offering a sacrifice in a literal temple, that'll sting. That'll be a denial that Jesus was the one sacrifice offered once for all, won't it? The sacrifice will be with the temple of God. We give our bodies a living sacrifice daily on a daily cross. Where do you get a daily cross? You have to be condemned for telling the truth. The oblation was the bread offering offered every morning about sunup around 6 o'clock and every evening at sundown at 6 o'clock. We being many are one bread and one body, the bread will cease. The bread is Christ in our hearts coming out of our mouth. Jim Brown, you're going to have to quit preaching that. We, you can be nice like the big Baptist church down the street, like the Pentecostals down the street, but you're running these guys down. The doctrine, I believe, runs them down because they lie. Does what Jesus does, says you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you compass sin, land to make one proselyte, and after he's made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Jesus was running down the Pharisees, wasn't he? The religious crowd. I really believe Catholicism was started on the Edict of Toleration. We've got political correctness, which is the same thing. Tolerance equals political correctness. We're trying to get everybody to stop being nasty to each other. Let's all get along. And we have a Jesus and he's wonderful. I love Jesus. Don't you love Jesus? Gosh, I want to slap somebody like that. Me and Dave were walking through through uh grocery store the other day and we both had on shirts accidentally that said God does not love everybody on the back of them both of us woman walked up and said oh yes God loves everybody and God loves you and you and he loves I, and I, started to start, I was trying to quote Romans 9 oh no 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 God loves everyone God loves I'm leaving God loves you I said he don't love you it was just goofy it angered me I want to say you don't even want to talk and he loves, he does, no, he does. And she's a smiling big, he loves you. I just want to say, get out of my life. She actually made a scene. Huh? She actually made a scene, right? There. She made a scene, that's right. We was trying to talk, and she, no, no, no. She's a charismatic, I'm quite sure. 
idiot, ignorant. Whew. She was very trying, wasn't she? Oh, man. Big time, yeah. Do I have any time, Mike? Three minutes. This next week, I'm going to come back. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at the thousand years, which is not thousand, it's two thousand. Let me just go ahead and say this. Thousand is not a cardinal number. Cardinal is, the, is like one, two, three, four, five, six, 997, 998, 999, 1,000. These are cardinal numbers where you can count something like this. I'm going to go into ordinal numbers. I'm going to tell you what numbers are about and tell you they didn't understand 1,000. 1,000 is a noun. It's not a numeral. And if I said five bluebirds flew over the barn, five is an adjective. A numeral is an adjective. A thousand is not an adjective. It's a noun. And I'll go into it next week and explain why it can be 1,000 or 2,000. And when you have a thousand year reign, that's not going to happen. We're in that right now. It's a 2,000 year period. I'm going to go into that. It's, uh, you have to have a determiner in front of the word thousand. You have to either have to have two, three, to say this, this kilioi, which is which is this die 2,000. You have to have a determiner to turn it into a numeral. To turn it, it doesn't turn. You have to have a, something to determine how many, in, instead of it being a noun, it's a noun like dozen. Dozen is one. It's not 12. There's 12 in a dozen, but dozen is one. And that's the way thousand is. And the, and the scholars will tell you it's not an adjective telling you how many. I'm going to get into that and we're going to go through that next week. But what we have to do is we're going to go into the 70th week, end of time, what's going to happen. There's some bad things going to happen. Jim, it's not happening now. Are you sure? There are so many things. These investigative reporters that write these books, they say America's living in a haze. They have no idea what's in the curtains for. This is, it could happen one day, just everything just start exploding. Everything from the economy to terrorism in these United States. They're talking about terrorism is... This is the first time we've had, they're building up terrorism in America. The very seat of it is up in one of the most dangerous areas is in St. Paul, Minnesota. We're on TV there. And they have what they call uh, Little Mogadishu up in, up in St. Paul. Mogadishu is the capital city of Somalia. And they see it's so packed full of Somalians and terrorist people. They have a hard time controlling it. But they've got it in every city in America. Do you think this is going to, we're going to need a peace process in the middle of the 70th week? Everything is so bad, they're going to come up with a way to get along temporarily. And then it'll all explode right in the middle of the 70th week. You say, Jim, I don't want to be scared. Do you want to be informed? I study and research and read all the time. I want to be informed as to what's going to happen. Am I out of time, Mike? Yeah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, help me to explain this to people so they can be aware of what's happening. Open the eyes of the elect. Crush us under your hand, Lord. I look forward to your coming. 
Lord, I'm tired. Give me strength to continue and mature the sheep. Cause them to be interested in your word. Lead us to your elect family. Open up doors for the ministry, Lord, and supply all the need and fight all of our battles. I'll keep preaching this to the death. In Jesus' name, amen. We're aiming at the end. Huh? This is the best Bible dictionary ever published. Seriously, mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. And this one here goes, the 70 weeks.